Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to now be talking about telling you all I know about my configuration system. That is yet another session of the Pierce Framework presentation, which means all the tools are available in the PowerShell Framework module and available from that. All right. We've got a journey to make. And for, first of all, we need, let me introduce to you the fellowship. Now, the fellows of our journey are stalwart heroes, braving the dangers of everyday IT work and the dangers that come involved with that. Let me tell you about Andy, the help desk jockey. Andy really is a great guy. He's trying to improve his lot, managed to finish college, got a first job, and he's got the bane of everybody in that position, and they keep bothering him and bothering him and bothering him. He really doesn't really get time to do a concentrated effort to get things done, to self-improve, to learn things. It's a stressful everyday day. All right, then he's got an awesome boss. Really, he's kind, he's gentle. He doesn't use more than 40 expletives towards him during a team meeting. Really, he's considerate. Great guy. His colleagues are highly motivated in finding the next tavern after work. They have great skills, social skills, drinking skills, bowling skills. And they have great interest in furthering those skills about IT. Well, they keep things going, and they're, they're satisfied with a lot in life. So that's, it works for them. And now, in this environment, he, he, he has some trouble self-improving. And then after work, he comes home and he can really, really get started on self-improvement there. Unless some people have other ideas what he could be doing with his free time. Like family, his six-month-old uh, six six daughter. <sighs> Fortunately, there is a great script library he can draw upon. That is 100% documented, tested, will never fail, and work under any circumstances. You will find there lock rotate, lock rotate new, lock rotate two, lock rotate three, lock rotate three two, new, new. <sighs> it's awesome, great. So how does Andy use PowerShell? Andy really uses interactive commands. He uses Google, finds his Google solution, pastes it into the command line, and helps it works. And if he's found enough of those that work, he starts putting scripts together. I mean, Andy is, is not dumb. He just doesn't have the time to do a concentrated effort. He copy pastes, maintains the things he likes to use. He's got a, a, an ISE open with 60 unsaved tabs of snippets that he keeps using. It works for him. It's great. So what does code really need for, to do for him? Well, he has no infrastructure, so he can't use any service. He can't use anything. He needs to get done with the tools he has at hand. He's got a four gigabyte RAMs on his machine that basically acres on the applications he needs to use for his job. He doesn't have any resources. Anything he needs to use needs to be simple. And it needs to be swift to adopt. It needs to be like copy paste and it needs to instantaneously work because he doesn't have time to troubleshoot it really, even if he had the skills where he's tr trying to build himself self towards that, but he's still far away. And user friendly is kind of part of that component he needs to be able to deal with it. So let's be honest, Andy is not going to be doing much of configuration. He's not gonna implement huge configurability into his scripts. He's not gonna be great at that. But he can consume configuration. He's a client for that. And what he uses is interactive commands. For exa a perfect example that is on every Windows 10 machine, PS readline set PS readline option. He can configure his PS readline with that. He could, for example, disable this nasty bell that, when, that you get when you hit backspace when you've got nothing to, to delete anymore, which is something I put in every single of my profile, and I can only highly recommend that. <laughs> All right, that's Andy. Superhero, two, year, two years later, he'll be absolutely awesome. And if you get a next on-ramp sponsorship, he'd be candidate for that. Let's look at Andrea. Andrea is an Active Directory superhero. She really is awesome. Long years of PowerShell scripting, long years of Active Directory, well-versed in other things. She's the model of competency. She's got a boss who really is a demanding, active, inter engaged boss. He doesn't micromanage. He tells her, I want results, and I want you to measure them. She's got co-workers, 
that are on average also pretty skilled, but it's a weird skill mix. Most of them won't be PowerShell superheroes, but they might be Active Directory, DNS, networking, or whatever else. They will be able to handle the command line. They will have be reasonably competent administrators, but still not quite on her level. And she doesn't work in a va vacuum. She's got complex interorganizational relationships that keep plaguing her and that complicate everything she builds. Every task, project she's involved with, she's involved with quite a few projects because for some reason applications tend to need some users authentication. And she's moving towards Azure AD, so still more involvement, still more PowerShell. So how does she use it? She, uses, she builds complex scripts and she tries to optimize her time and efficiency by going into tooling, building modules, reusable high quality code, but she doesn't have much infrastructure. Why? Not because she couldn't justify the budget, but she's working in Active Directory, it's security relevant, tier zero, and the more infrastructure you have, the greater your attack surface. So she, try, she tries to make do with the onboard resources available. Reliability is the one most critical aspect. If you mess up reliability, open a hole in your Active Directory, I know a few people that, that will um, really appreciate that, but it's probably not gonna be your boss. It needs to be manage manageable. Not only because manageable means less effort over the long run, but also because our manager wants information data. He wants to be able to tell me how much uptime do we have on every single domain control, and he wants countable, measurable, provable numbers, not some estimate, uh, they didn't fail this week which is one of the responses I recently got. Don't mind that. And her tools should be as compatible with each other to optimize reuse. So with that available, with that infrastructure, and she's very much appreciating configuration entries because she not only has to manage you know, the production ID, she also has the test, Q&A, and other aspects where she needs to reuse her tools and she can't use high infrastructure, she needs monitoring, there's a perfect solution for it, well proven and reliable onto death. So she's gonna want group policy. If something fails with group policy, well, there's events, you can track it in your monitoring, you can trace why it failed, where it failed, how it failed, it's perfect. Now, the third fellow of a fellowship is Linus, the web admin. L Linus is a cool guy, he's like the super power powered person who manages wild animals who also also known as web applications he is basically the glue between the app development team and the infrastructure mostly he uses linux but unfortunately at least as far as some of his colleagues are concerned he also has been tainted he needs to do some web applications that are running on iis do active directory integration that kind of thing so um, his coworkers on the, for most of the things, don't like him much. Because, you know, these coworkers, especially all those Linux administrators, they, he wants to force them to install an inferior extra shell on their machines. There's really no point in doing this. He should be learning a proper shell. <laughs> okay, Linus already does, but uh, he's, learned, he's got a bit spoiled by PowerShell. He doesn't want to go back, but that's a different story. But what this means really, if he wants to have any serious collaboration from these guys, he needs to give them tools they can use the way they're used to using tools. He can't just tell them, oh, and then you need to do something the way Windows would be doing it, but he needs to make it compatible for them. And let's be honest, doing uh, registry-based um, configuration is not gonna work in this scenario. Also, he's got direct customer impact. If one web application goes down, the customer immediately notice, notices. If one domain controller goes down for Andrea, it's usually not gonna have an instant impact except if you're standing with your own boss. If you notice this, which you probably will, basically because it's slightly unretentive, but that's a different story. All right, so how is he using PowerShell? Usually he's writing a lot of unattended scripts that, and standalone tools that are optimized for efficiency and code performance. Something that is small, fast, and excellent. If you've got a web application, and let's look at startup times. If I could make an Azure function, cold start, half a second shorter, I'd be getting a significant bonus. I mean, really significant. It scales up what's 
insanely. So every single piece of efficiency loss is going to is going to cost him. Everything, any every piece of efficiency gain, is going to work well for him. He needs, of course, have have a high reliability because any failure of a web service will have instant will instantaneously be noticed by the users. Unless they're too busy taking a coffee break, which can happen if you're looking at human resources. Not much infrastructure, because the infrastructure doesn't belong to him. The web, web, web developer, they can get basically any infrastructure they can justify. The infrastructure people can tell we can't do without more infrastructure, but he's basically always has to defer to them, and they don't like him, so not so much. And of course, as far as possible, he wants to have cross-platform. Everything should be interusable, which is a high bar to set, but it works. All right. And he uses, of course, configuration files, because that is the one way to provide configuration information that his Linux-based coworkers will accept. And it's the only one that really works cross-platform equally well for everybody. Possibly JSON, possibly CSV, possibly an ini file. Really depends on what his requirements are, but it's probably going to be file-based. Okay. Now, the last hero of our fellowship of PowerShell superheroes is Joey, the DevOps engineer. Joey lives in a world of constant change. He's got short project-based uh, uh, engagements. He keeps going and going and going, he needs to have master a huge set of tools, and the friggin' tools keep changing faster than he can learn them. Like, he can almost never go really deep in one, and even if he can manage to maintain that, uh, still, he's going to have so much ecosystem changes, things he has to keep track of. It's a hard battle every single day. And in the same uh, position, he's got lots of coworkers exchanging, because every single project change, a new person, new people are in there, and that comes at a significant price. So what he's doing is he's thinking and coding in workflows. I'm not talking about PowerShell workflows. I'm thinking about CD, is, is the ICD pipeline, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step five. Decision gates, multiple deployment paths. He's thinking in architecturing the entire code and development flow. Um, th this really reflects into the coding, the way he uses code. And of course, given that he has things change a lot, he needs to change his workflows a lot. So reusable code really, really pays for him. He needs to be flexible without any question. His code needs to be compatible with as much as he can, because even if he currently is operating on Windows machines, there's no guarantee that the next project is not going to be Linux containers. Cross-platform, as far as possible, no, no binding to the platform if he can ever manage it. And all the tools he provides needs to be easy to use, because with all that change of team members, with this flux and this ch rapid change in technology, he doesn't have time to teach them complex tooling. So everything he provides needs to be fast. So he uses, provides configuration using configuration files for his CICD pipelines, for the way he maintains and operates his workflows. And for the infrastructure he provides, he deploys all this infrastructure as code. So desired state configuration is probably going to be his favorite tool, whether he applies it directly or using a third-party so, uh, solution to manage it for him. But it's got, probably going to be DC-based. So these are superheroes, and every superhero needs a nemesis. Otherwise, there's not much point in being a hero. And it's called a project. <laughs> OK. Now, we've got a new task because the human resources manager thinks they absolutely need a new highly confidential, privately supporting, centralized web platform with Active Directory authentication. Of course, it must be Windows-based and SQL Server backend, and it must be totally secure, at least from the IT department. I'm not talking about the attacker, but that's a different story. All right, now we've got Joey, Andrea, Linus, and Andy. They have to work together. Joey needs to manage the automation pipeline. Linus makes sure that the web application kind of integrates with the platform, because that works well. Andrea is taking care of the uh, interaction, of the AD interaction, and Andy is going to supposed to keep the users at bay until they are done finishing the thing. 
problem is, well, they're all using different tools. There's no intercompatibility. They can't really collaborate with the existing tools that they need to reteach, recreate. So, and TRIA would have great Active Directory tooling, but they don't integrate. So the project gets delayed, <laughs> which makes Zoe sad. Zoe sad. <laughs> it also makes his boss slightly angry. And the journey's over. All right. Let's take a look at how the configuration system can help with that. Let's look at how the hell does this work. We have one configuration layer, an one storage where the configuration information is stored. Think of it this like a huge hash table. It's got a Every setting has a name, every setting has a value, and every setting has a gazillion of meta information that all the features that Fred needs are included. So if you've got a module, like the fellowship, it just accesses that store. That store is in memory. This is process-wide. There is no file. There is no anything that backs it. It, is only, it only exists as long as PowerShell is running. And other modules can just as easily access the same store, can maintain their own settings, can pilfer the settings of other modules. The way modules usually can with variables, it totally works just fine. And with this isolation layer, they don't have any interaction, any idea where their information and configuration information actually comes from. They literally don't know, and there is no way for them to find out. The only thing that each individual module knows is the default settings they themselves declare. Other than that, where the information comes from has no impact. So you can feed it in a few different ways. And if those few don't really uh, work for you, build your own. It's extensible. I am hoping you can find something for that, but OK. Now, with this. We already have a centralized data interface, and the modules don't need to know where it comes from. And if, if both Linux, when, if Linus, Joey, Andy, and Andrea would have used this, they could have easily shared the configuration across all their tools without them having to even have known each other before in any kind of way. So Andrea could have deployed some pipeline configuration settings using group policy, if that would have been her thing, or show you some JSON configuration file, would have been fine. So where the hell, how the hell does this happen, really? And there are two ways how configuration information entered the configuration store. Either we have automatic import. At this point, you don't have to do anything in your module. You import your module, and the settings are there. No action, you don't need to mind where this stored, what operation platform I am at. It just happens. And otherwise, which is something you would be doing in workflows, in script front end script files in your work in your CI C D pipeline, you use import PSF config, point it at a resource. This can be a JSON file. This can be a web link to a resource. If you extend the system with a SQL server plugin, this could be a connection string. Anything you need to access the configuration data, and that's already that. Automatic import. There are a few ways to pro provide information to the PS Framework configuration system that where it will automatically pick up all the information data and import them automatically. You can do this file-based on a persistent basis. In Windows, that would be program data. You can use it on a user basis for the local machine, local app data, or app data for roaming profiles in, which, in case you want to move them across machines. On Linux, there are uh, certain paths where it calculates what would be the best location for that, so you don't need to manage the paths on, the, on that as well. Uh, shout out to Joel for that. I got the permission to use this, uh, the way he does this in his own configuration module. Thank you. 
And if you're on Windows, you have a few other me uh, methods of going around. For example, registry. Specifically, you can apply default settings on a per user basis or per computer basis. Or you can play the nasty administrator and tell them this is going to be this setting and not otherwise. Which will produce some yellow error mes warning messages or red error message if the user tries to persist in his pursuits. Yeah, it's not a guarantee, but as long as you have code integrity, the user should not be able to work around that. And with that, goodbye PowerPoint. Neglect you. Okay. Glorious, hello, PowerShell. Did I ever mention I li absolutely love and adore VS Code? No, we can't read information. If I, anybody knows how to bug fix this, I'd be most appreciated. So what we have is we've got a big store of configuration information that's available to us. If we just want to list them all, get pairs of config without any parameter, this is all in memory. These are the default options. PowerShell framework itself comes with quite a few of them, how you can configure it. For example, for those who attended the session day before yesterday on logging, the entire logging system is manageable for that. So the, all the logging configuration would also be part of that, deployable through that system. And this can easily be extended for additional ones. And as you can see, we not only have a name and a value, we also have what is for me the Actually, the most important property we've got a description. <laughs> because I know that one year down the road, I will no longer know what it's going to do. Now, this is the thing I use for, in my, for my personal user convenience a command that will just m change the path of the console to my temp folder because I dump data in there that I just want to forget about it. It will automatically disappear at some point. And we can start a new PowerShell process, and it will, well, load the same setting, because this is the way the module set it up. It's a default value, points at the temp, temp drive, good. So let's change that. We update it with set of config, the name and the value of the setting. And let's go update it. Get PSF config value is what we would be using if we want to access the data within the code and we want to retrieve the information and use it because that really just gives us the value and not the full configuration object of all the extra information. So we change the setting and, well, it's still the old setting. As I mentioned, the configuration store is within the current process. So just running set piece of config does not affect anybody else. However, process not run space. So if you parallelize, the alternative run space will have access to the same settings. If you want to persist this as, in, as um, interactive command, change the setting for us on the current machine, we use register PSF config, which will write it by default to the current user, but we have a scope parameter that allows us to pick, like, allows us to pick the various location. Of course, changing system-wide settings requires local admin. Would be kind of a problem if that was not the case. By default, on any Windows machine, it will write to HKCU into the registry for Linux on a JSON configuration file. And the value is stored using PowerShell serialization. So you can store complex objects and restore them and they will still be objects. Even though the storage backend is file or registry or SQL table. And now that we have registered it, 
the new mod, uh, the new the other file in, in the new process instantly picked it up. There was no import piece of config involved. So when I try to pitch this, uh, this configuration component, I usually separate it into, sep uh, into different specific set of use cases. To be exact, managing individual scripts, like scheduled task script or a uh, utility script that you share with your coworkers, an entire module where the configuration system is very similar to like an options menu for an application, or for configuration data sets used in the ICD pipelines. So let's take a look at the first solution. And of course, we've got a script prepared for that. This is a script that doesn't do much. Usually, let's say it tries to send an email to a mail server. And for this, we, of course, need to point it at an email server. If we hard code it into the script, which is the usual way of doing things, and deploy the, the script on many servers, we've got multiple scripts that do that. And over the years, we have got thousands of script versions across hundreds of servers. And then the dreaded mail server migration comes along. And the new mail server is somewhere in the cloud. Uh, for example, Office 365, Exchange Online, and all your scripts suddenly no longer send any emails. Not so great. So what you can do is you specify a parameter for the script, so at least you can parameterize the invocation. And you can use get piece of config value on a setting that does not even exist. It will just return nothing or whatever you specify in the fallback. So using this notation, we have a default parameter without having any configuration deployed, mail1.company.domain. If we use the script in a scheduled task, we can parameterize it, as everybody would. And if we use the default value, we can later, at any time, deploy the setting using group policy, DSC, or whatever else a tool, uh, tool of choice is, and update it. While we're about DSC, there is a DSC module for PS Framework configuration. It's just Pro. Yeah, it was my first and last attempt to build something on PowerShell classes. I was assuming since it was especially designed for this, it might actually work. I was being optimistic. But uh, I will be recreating and fixing that fairly soon, so it will be possible to re use a PowerShell framework configuration resource rather than having to use a registry resource. Equally, equally up coming, uh, coming up in the next month will be a generator for ADMX templates that you feed with configuration and it will generate you an ADMX template for, active, for group policy, which makes that a lot less painful. If anybody is, is particular um, familiar with Puppet, Ansible, or any other tools and can give me a hint on how to make it more compatible with that, more easy to deploy, please speak with me after the session. I'm highly interested. OK. It uses the, the default value. Let's update the script, the configuration, to point it at a beerfactory.org. And it works. Of course, we run into the same registration, uh, the same issue if we go to a new process. So we need to register the setting first or deploy it using a management. Now, as a module, we would please work. <sighs> Great. As a module, we declare our configuration on import. It's a script we run once, and if we afterwards use get piece of config, we get access to the settings that are deployed like that yeah, continuously. How does that look like in actual code? We've got a module name, the name of the setting, a value, and then there's this initialize thing. I'm not going to dig, dig too deep into that. Uh, that's basically an entire session after we've done this. Suffice to say, this initialize tells you 
I'm at the, I'm at declaration of a configuration and I'm going to do some voodoo. Validation. I can specify what is the legal value for the setting. And if the predefined set of validations isn't enough for you, you can easily extend this. Customize the validation rules, customize the error messages if somebody provides something evil. And of course, we need a description. So let's use this done, um, later within, a within the function of a module. Let's take a look at new beer. New beer adds a beer to the fridge, which is obviously a highly critical task. However, there is one problem. What happens if the fridge is full? I mean, seriously, th this is a major dilemma here. So if using get piece of config value to access the entry, and if the size is lower or equal to the number of beers currently in the fridge, we are throwing up beer getting warm exception. Okay, now we told it to be an integer. Let's just try to specify something illegal. And it instantly said, no, can't do that. However, we can increase the size, register it, and The module has just been updated and consumed. Now, what we can see is before we imported the beer factory module, the setting was already there. So the actual import from wherever you persist the uh, information happens when you import the PS framework module. It's available beforehand. And that means that settings can be applied without necessarily your module already having to, be, having to exist. For example, this is relevant if you've got a user profile consideration and you, don't want, you want to update a setting. In traditional, the traditional set, set config command, set options command, like set piece reason option, you need to have the module imported. So if you've got 10 modules and you're configuring the, all of them, this would mean in your, as part of your profile action, everything would be imported. It would not be quite fast user experience. And this is one of the aspects that initializes is for, even after you declare it, it adds additional meta information, but s still uses the new value. So the setting survived. I might want to discard that session. Thank you. All right. CI CD, we need a configuration file uh, that we want to have checked in as part of the source control so we can trace any kind of configuration changes. And we can generate this configuration file using export PSF config. So first we define them. We need to only use the, we only need the name and the value for that. And then there's the simple export parameter. By default, PowerShell framework configuration uses PowerShell serialization. This provides the highest object integrity. For example, if you want to persist credentials, authentication, login information, it serializes the credential object and restores it. But uh, if you want to check it into source control, let's just say CLI XML is not the user, most user-friendly format. Could be improved upon. So we declare the settings. generate the file, and if we now open this in VS Code, we can see the settings name and value are included. There is a new way of providing JSON-style information that is, not, that is easier to, to consume and read, but that is the auto-generated generated version if you don't care that much about readability. It still tracks settings by setting, line by line, the changes across the file history, so for, some, for most, it's uh, good enough to go along with. Okay. So how would our pipeline use this? It imports the JSON file with import PSF config. And then afterwards, it can use get PSF config value to access the data. Same as before.
data imported, data reu reusable. If you are also of interest, if you're using CI CD pipeline, if you have multiple action steps in the same agent, so long as your as long as your container is not disposed of, you can easily pass full op PowerShell object from one action step to the other by persisting the configuration and then importing it later on, which has come in handy quite a few times because declaring variables to string and then restoring them from that is usually not the best way to go about that. Okay. Let's talk about validation. We can consume common validation rules. Let's take a look. These are mostly the predefined validation rules, and if all you care about whether it's a double or not, using those is fully enough. However, Let's create a rule that only allows foo or bar as legal input. Because sometimes we just have a specific set of values that should be legal. And in that regard, we need a script block that we register with register PSF config validation. It needs to have a unique name, otherwise you will overwrite the previous validation. And it needs to accept the value that is to be validated. It needs to return an object with three properties, success, value, and message. M message is empty if there's no error. So we check whether it's in. It's not a foo no bar. It's not a success return, and that's everything you need to tell it. It's illegal. Otherwise, we assign the input value. This allows us to also type convert information. It should be in the destined type. Let's say we validate for integer, and the user provides a string that is a legal number, it's only in string format, then it should be stored as integer, not a string. You should type convert it to the intended logical data type. Thank you very much. One of these days, somebody might make me like VS Code. F credit. We configure the setting. A new setting with the validation for bar. And if you now try to assign the number 42, illegal. Also, didn't change it, it's still foo. Updating it to bar, validation was successful, it works. Now, one of the major features that I've spent quite a bit of time in are handler. When somebody changes the value, you can assign a script block that should be executed. What this means is you can create proxy configuration for systems, applications, modules that do not implement the PS framework. So if somebody changes your setting, it executes a script block, and the script block logic would apply the setting to whatever tool for configuration the target system is using. This also applies to settings that have been deployed by configuration during import of PS framework or during import of your module. So let's create a configuration item, a test that will simply echo the input value back to the back to screen. We've set the value, we change it to something else, and the script block executed, and we get written a message in this case. Yeah. And the way you know, there's always the demo gods involved in somewhere, and generally have the voice in a presentation. In my case, they managed a preventive strike. I am accidentally failed to push the last changes before I left, left the aircraft. So the originally intended um, extension tooling example with all nice how, let's, let's implement XML as input, uh, input format has been left in Germany. Sorry. So by default, there are two schemas 
that is basically import logic for how you process whatever input data or resource link should be converted into configuration data. And let's just take a look. It's not going to be pretty, but it's the best I can do to show. We registered under our name, and it receives a resource that is the link, for example, a URL link, SQL server connection, string, whatever you use to point at the resource, or even the resource it itself, if, if, for example, you provide XML string data and your import script understands that. That's totally legit. And there are a few settings that are involved, specifically um, the parameters on import PSF config that you should be respecting. For example, the peak parameter tells the command to not actually import the configuration, but return it as object so we can peek at what would have been imported right now. Did it work right? All right, and other than that, it's, well, 189 pretty much unreadable code that will at the end call set PSF config and apply the settings. Sorry, but theoretically you could at whatever logic you need in order to import it. All right, any questions? So was this inspired by uh, ASP.NET Web Application Configuration XML, structure where uh, you can co uh, integrate configurations from multiple configurations files? Um, no. I must admit, I have had to deal with this too much to ever uh, associate any positive emotion towards that. <laughs> I'll admit this was not from a web admin perspective, but from an oh, ID, security, exchange, automation, Windows operating system, whatever multi-tool perspective, where the customer says, oh, we've got this problem with this web application. Are you willing to take a look? Well, okay, but I can't promise any results. From that kind of expertise perspective, I moved into that, so. No, it was not my friend. It did not happen that way. This was originally evolved from managing code by group policy. And I just suddenly noticed, oh, if I do this, then I can do that, and then I need to consider this. And then there was this PowerShell summit, PowerShell Conf, PS Conf EU 2018. I showed it to Jeffrey Snower. He was very attentive audience. He's an awesome listener. If you ever get him to listen to your module, design module presentation, it's awesome. He listened for 10 minutes, really take, took a look at it, pointed the finger at the one strategic issue that opened Vistas. It's like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so um, yeah, basically put it, you need to have it import from JSON file in order to make it CI-CD compatible and maybe Linux compatible. Um, from that, this took, uh, uh, took off to the point that we have a freely extensible input schema system that you're not bound at whatever I thought of, but can easily do it yourself. I must admit I'm a great friend of extensibility. Not only makes the code highly flexible, but especially, and this is a real nasty open source trick, you should be writing this down, if you have ob obvious connection points to your module, it immensely lowers the ba contribution barrier for other people. So if not somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm wanna, want to import XML, you do this implementation, Contact me, I'll be very happy to do this, to do this interactively and solve, uh, help you solve any problems you have with that. And after that, you've got this, this XML import ready and good to go. Well, you already have done everything you need to do a pull request. And then you don't need to have to, um, to make sure this, uh, this import provider is uh, distributed because it will be based on part of the core package and it will be available everywhere you do that, as soon as you update into the latest version. Which, by the way, is another part Latest version, the PowerShell framework is under a no breaking change guarantee. I must live with a few bad decisions I made because changing them would be a breaking change. Um, who of you was, uh, was along for the logging presentation? Yeah. All right, those of you know, know there's an automatic debug log with automatic log rotate with CSV export. By default, this log does not produce CSV header. I was short-sighted, I just wanted to get it done, and if I were to change that, anybody that automates anal analyzing the log files would have a broken, breaking change. 
because by now, currently they do add disease vehicle explicitly. There's a configuration option that opts into modern logs and fixes that problem. But it's not by default because I would be introducing a breaking change. That's uh, pretty much one of the burns I've taken upon myself because if you build something on that and can't rely on its keeping working a year down the road, you'll probably not be all that happy with me. Actually, I wouldn't be happy with me because I'm probably the person building the most on the PS framework myself. Any other questions? Doesn't sound like it. Thank you very much. If you've got any further questions, please feel free to speak to me. If you are the kind of sticker holics like all of the usual attendees of sticker and the notebook uniform, I've got a few PS framework stickers come up in a little time.